Thank you, Matthew, and good morning. Um, a long-standing idea with a new relevance. That's how its proponents are portraying the idea of a tax on financial transactions. Well, we once called the Tobin tax after its inventor, the great um, economist James Tobin. The tax, as you've heard, has now been snappily rebranded the Robin Hood tax. And it's touted as a means not just of raising money for development aid or any other good cause, but of reining in the banks, which have been at the center of the global financial crisis. In recent months, it's been given impetus by support, sometimes quite unexpected support, from various governments and officials, including our own Adair Turner, chairman of the Financial Services Authority. The Robin Hood tax campaign calls it a tax on banks, not on you or I. Critics, on the other hand, say it will do little to reduce financial volatility and the costs will simply be passed on to banks' customers. To discuss the tax, we have, uh, I mean, quite literally a star-studded array of guests. First of all, a speech from Professor Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University. Second, a film introduced by a couple of campaigners I imagine you may well recognize. And finally, a panel discussion of the themes and issues surrounding the tax. First of all, um, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Jeff is director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University and an advisor to the United Nations. But perhaps above and beyond that, he's been intimately connected for many years now with issues of development and growth and poverty and uh, debt reduction across the developing world. He has a wide range of interests and is listened to, I think, in pretty much every country on earth. Jeff. Thank you very much, Alan, and uh, thanks uh, to the Robin Hood tax campaign for uh, organizing this event so that we can have a discussion on a, uh, uh, on a proposition whose uh, time has uh, been here for a long time but uh, is finally going to come to fruition now. I guess I do go back a long way that I remember the original Tobin tax, which is now 38 years uh, since its proposal in, in 1972. And James Tobin was a magnificent person. He was a hero to me as I got started in, in economics, uh, a brilliant analyst and an in, in exquisite gentleman and a, a person who understood uh, the important things uh, in the world and in the world of economics. So the fact that he proposed this a long time ago, almost in, in the same way that it's uh, being proposed right now, is, is actually a, a very good sign that uh, this campaign is on the right track. The ideas were correct then, uh, they're even more urgent now. Tobin said that uh, the financial sector was unstable uh, and uh, under-regulated and under-taxed uh, and that global public goods were under-provided and that the revenues from a proper taxation of the financial system could also help to meet global public goods. He made that linkage already back in 1978, uh, 32 uh, years ago, and I think it's uh, ever more urgent that we uh, see these uh, two parts of this proposal in the same light. It goes back a long way and for a real reason. <coughs> Something's gonna happen along the lines of a Robin Hood tax uh, if we are uh, vigilant uh, if we're paying attention. Uh, and the reason is the following. Most importantly, we need the money. Uh, we don't, uh, we do not have uh, the public revenues out of our current tax system uh, to be able to provide uh, the uh, a absolutely needed uh, goods and services uh, from the public sector the idea that we're going to close our deficits uh, only by cuts of spending uh, is unimaginable, actually, if we're going to remain uh, civilized. And so we need uh, revenues. That's number one. That's why this is uh, going to happen, actually. 
Second is the financial sector itself is undertaxed. Uh, it's also out of control still. Uh, in, after nearly bringing down the world economy uh, in the last two years, we still have a spectacle that is of such staggering arrogance that I find it hard to imagine. Our bankers on Wall Street uh, took home, uh, they make the rules, they take the decisions, uh, and they uh, decide on the compensation. They took home $20 billion of end-of-year bonuses out of my money. It's not all mine, uh, but uh, it's, it's mine and uh, my fellow citizens uh, because uh, we bailed them out and they put the money in their pocket. And uh, this was all viewed uh, with, a, with a straight face. Unfortunately, also by the Washington politicians, uh, viewed as if that's normal. But of course, the Washington politicians are, uh, get their campaigns paid for by the same people. Uh, so the money is, uh, is spread around uh, nicely. Now, what's extraordinary is that in the midst of this downturn, Wall Street had its most profitable year in history, it seems. Uh, the estimate of the New York Comptroller last week was of a $55 billion profit year for Wall Street. Now, where'd that come from in the midst of the biggest downturn since uh, the Great Depression? It came from the fact that Wall Street is literally uh, next door to the Fed. Uh, and the Fed turned on the spigots this year and essentially gave uh, zero interest money to the insider banks in vast amounts for them to relend and make vast trading profits. Uh, that's called seniorage, in essence, in economics. It's the privilege of income that comes from the right to print money. But that seniorage uh, is uh, normally in our textbooks collected by government, but here it's in essence uh, being uh, distributed to uh, uh, a few financial houses who then declare that they're doing God's work and pocket the money and tens of billions of dollars of compensation and, and bonuses. And we're supposed to sit back and say, oh, no, no, you can't touch that. That's a fragile, uh, that, that's a, a fragile leaf and uh, shouldn't be taxed and so forth as we're bleeding uh, in, in public revenues right now. So that's my second proposition, which is we need money. And you can see where the money uh, can be gotten in part. And that's from an undertaxed and still vastly underregulated financial sector. Third, we're not meeting our global obligations. And so whatever we can do to direct that revenue towards solemn commitments that we took actually in this country five years ago uh, in uh, a wonderful uh, public outpouring of responsibility that has not been followed through by our politicians generally, uh, we need to do as well. You'll remember that in Glen Eagles, because of the Make Poverty History campaign, uh, because of the uh, far-sightedness of the people of this country, because of commitments uh, that uh, were finally recognized to be in uh, a uh, not only an urgent need, but a self-interest as well. We promised something rather basic, uh, not even generous enough, but the promise was that from the time of Glen Eagles till today, we would double the amount of financial assistance to Africa. That was roughly an extra $30 billion. What's actually happened? We're about $20 billion short of that promise. Well, I know where to get $20 billion. Uh, we just saw it go into the pockets of the least deserving people uh, who are worried mainly about whether their wine cellars have 20,000 bottles, 30,000 bottles, or 40,000 bottles, uh, whereas uh, people who are dying because they don't have the most basics in life are uh, only uh, whether they're aware that the promises are made or only aware of the fact that their child is uh, hungry again today, I don't know, it, it all depends. But they are suffering uh, at uh, our 
uh, lack of uh, basic follow through. So here we have revenues that need to be collected. Here we have clear responsibilities. Uh, we're not talking about a penny, as far as I'm concerned, of new promises for anything. It's only a matter of following through on solemn life and death commitments that we made and have not fulfilled. And putting these together, in my view, makes complete sense. It makes further sense for this country, by the way, for the following reason. By adopting this proposal, the UK and colleagues in Europe can and should lean on my country quite hard and say, you get on the case too. This is a matter of harmonization of policy, and it's also a matter of burden sharing. Where did this financial crisis start? It started in Wall Street. Where is the biggest unmet or unfulfilled obligation on development assistance? It's in the United States. And so one part of this campaign that is extremely important in my view <coughs> is not to say, oh, I wonder what the United States is going to do, <coughs> but rather to say, we need to collect revenues, we need to follow through, we need to do this in a harmonized way, and you, the United States, need to be part of this now. And you have to pony up because it's not right for Europe to be taking on, and thank goodness, uh, still, even in this very hard time, uh, continuing on its obligations towards 0 0.7, and the United States uh, doing nothing of the kind. And so I view this campaign, and the, the final uh, piece of it is as a way also to bring in a global shared responsibility. This is a global campaign. It says that we're going to follow through on international obligations with proper burden sharing, and we're going to make sure that a global industry, the global financial industry, in a harmonized way is taxed adequately to be playing its role. And we're not going to continue in a world, I hope, where bankers brazenly smirk as they pocket unconscionable amounts of money of our money, direct bailout money, and we fail to live up to the most basic and essential obligations that we've made for a decent world. And that's why I'm happy to be here today. Oh, well, thank you very much, Jeff. There'll be an um, opportunity to ask Jeff questions later as part of the panel. Um, but for the moment, let me introduce uh, the next two guests we have. As I say, probably recognizable by most of you, um, Bill Nye and Richard Curtis, um, among the most prominent members, I think, of Britain's film community, actors, producers, writers, but also activists of many years standing who've worked on a variety of issues to do with the developing world and who have picked up the Robin Hood tax as, I think, their latest campaign. And they have a film that they would like to talk about and introduce. Hello, I'm Richard, um, self-evidently not Bill Nye, um, uh, much less old uh, and serious than um, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> while he was thinking about James Tobin, I was thinking about Jimi Hendrix. Um, and uh, I'm just going to show you a few things that we've been working on with regard to this campaign. Uh, as far as I see it, I do see it as in a sequence. I am a, a strong supporter of the Jubilee Debt Campaign. Interestingly, another financial campaign where initial reaction was saying this is impossible, it will break down the whole system of international loans, can't happen, and suddenly we have you know, 40 million more children in school as a result of the cancellation of debt which countries haven't really noticed or paid for. Um, and uh, then we worked on the Make Poverty History campaign, and um, Jeff has spoken eloquently about that. And um, meanwhile, I've been doing uh, comic relief in this country. Uh, and I feel as though we do 
represent an enormous, slightly concealed but passionate commitment by people in this country towards basic um, tenets of justice. It was interesting that when, even now in the recession, um, Red Nose Day, I think this year, raised 82 million pounds, uh, which was 20 million pounds more than ever before at a time when people are meant to be uh, having trouble. And I think, in fact, the moment when there's a general economic problem is the moment when people start to empathize even more with those things that are toughest, both at home uh, and abroad. And if ever anyone says that Americans don't feel these things, I think there's not the same tradition and exposure about, for instance, development issues. Um, but when we did, um, I went over and worked on a show called Idol Gives Back, which was the same, a bit like Comic Relief, but in the context of American Idol. And we made $55 million from the American public in 70 minutes, I think, uh, which is completely unexpected. But when faced by these issues, they could completely see uh, what was just and felt it was natural uh, to them. Um, what makes this campaign, I think, so interesting is the sort of tripartite nature of the campaign and of where the money is supposed to go. Uh, as with Comet Relief, where we give money both at home and abroad, uh, the plan is that uh, money raised by such a tax would, of course, 50% um, of it would be retained domestically. I know in America the most passionate campaigners for this are working for jobs. Uh, in America, many jobs have indeed been lost as a result of the current financial crisis. Um, and then there's um, our sort of very simple plan would be that 25% would go towards the environment. I feel this very strongly that the younger generation are really wondering whether or not they all know about environmental issues. They all don't want to grow up in a world which is messed up. And uh, I feel they're particularly passionate to see somebody put some money forward for this to happen. Because there's a lot, lot of talk about it, but at Copenhagen, certainly no big finance. And then the development part about which I feel so passionate. And, you know, there are passionate and unusual examples here. It was interesting that Bill Gates, you know, has now raised his commitment on vaccines to 10 billion and asked the world in some way, that's one man, asked the world to match it. And I think it is a great time for a big, heroic, interesting step forward. I feel as though this campaign is a glimpse of the future. I, as an optimist, but oddly enough, I think if you look at the progress People in this country were happy about slavery 200 years ago, happy about poverty and disease 150 years ago. I think we do move towards humanity, and I bet that 100 years from now, we do have the equivalent of an international welfare arrangement. And this is a glimpse of such a thing, where you actually say, yes, if, some, if there is emerging a way in which you could get rid of malaria, which kills over a million people a year, um, completely treatable disease, then surely that can be done if you can, in a snap, find the money to bail out the banks. Um, the fact that 500,000 women die uh, in childbirth unnecessarily around the world, that's got to be sorted out. It's very hard to imagine. And therefore, if we find ourselves in the situation that Jeff has described, where there may be a radical and brilliant thing to do, and certainly my appeal to the banking community is that these very brilliant, serious men who have applied so much wit and brain power to working out how to make more money for the banks should actually, genuinely, passionately, and compassionately apply themselves not towards 10 ways of saying no, but to be partners in working out a way in which to say yes uh, to this. Um, let me just guide you through some of what we are trying to do because what our aim in this campaign is to put wind in the sails of a complex economic thing. So we changed Tobin to Robin, very easy, only had to change one letter. Um, uh, very cheap. Um, and as you can see, so if you just go back, there is an extraordinary array of supporters. I'm delighted to see the Royal Society for the Prevention of I mean, for the protection of birds there. Not the, pre not the prevention of birds, obviously. Uh, they, they want the officers. Um, and, you know, brilliant, the Salvation Army's there, one's there, all these brilliant um, development groups, uh, Greenpeace UK. It is a huge coalition, and what we want is to create something where the public 
are allowed to say the same public who give money to Comrade Relief, the same public who have suffered as a result of the recession, that they would love this to be a big, exciting thing, a new solution for a new decade. So if you head on, this is our basic proposition. Um, support the bankers. They do so much to make the world a better place. Um, we would like to transform to support the tax on bankers. Uh, they could do so much. And this is, this, we, we're placing this ad wherever we can. All, this, all the stuff that you'll see are ads that we're getting free work for, free placements for. On we go. We're asking everyone to be part of the world's greatest bank job. And if you head on there, in fact, that was, that was um, uh, on, the, on the Bank of England at 4 o'clock in the morning the other day on one of our uh, many launches. We're, uh, without permission, but I'm sure they're very proud of it now. <laughs> Um, but they can say we were there at the beginning of the campaign. And we do live in an exciting and brilliant new world. And, and it, it was extraordinary how many people now are wearing these little green masks, if you look at them on Twitter and on Facebook. And um, on um, unseating the mighty Cher Cheryl Cole for a few days when we launched the Robin Hood tax, it was the most discussed issue uh, on Twitter with hundreds of thousands of people suddenly realizing that he was a new opportunity. And I think that we will get a lot of energy and pressure from the social networking sites. Um, as you can see, we're aiming for coverage. We're aiming to discussion. I think it's, there's no point these days in launching a campaign and hoping that no one will argue with you. Um, but what I do think is there is an unarguable need for the money and we want everyone to state what they think, discuss it, and try and see whether or not some government, particularly all three parties in the run-up to the election, can have the courage to take this on as policy. Um, here are some posters that we've done just to show the tripartite nature. Nurses at home. I I'm more interested in the humans than the polar bears, but um, polar bears are a good. Um, it was a choice between a polar bear and an Eskimo, and we thought the polar bear was cuter. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then all the needs in, uh, in the developing world. And uh, as you know, we're going to use all the metaphors and imagery that we can for Robin Hood. And on the target, you see UK public services, poverty abroad, and climate change. Uh, and we hope that there'll be, oh, and, and no, it's all right. Uh, this is Sienna Miller. Um, if we keep whipping through, there's Lamar. Here we go. And so we're hoping um, that, you know, celebrities, there's a lot of argument about celebrity involvement in things, and I passionately think that is unfair. What I find from my experience on Comet Relief is if you walked up to any man in the street and you said to him, by the way, if you make a little film for us, it will make 200,000 pounds to help the poor, you would have to be subhuman to say, well, no, I won't. And I feel the same about um, a lot of famous people who get involved in campaigns like this. They are simply representing they don't particularly want to do it. They have enough pictures in heat. But they're representing normal people, which they indeed are, caring passionately about obvious concerns. Um, it's so great that Alan is here, because I know that he'll be fighting to have these two um, ads placed as soon as possible in the FT. Um, the, color, uh, the color representation is not perfect here, but that is a delicate FT pink that we intend to uh, place it in. Um, and here we go. The loose change argument is one of the arguments. It really is 0.05. And when we say that, by the way, there's been a lot of jumping on the 0.05 saying, well, that's too big for some things, too big, too small for others. It's absolutely true that that is an average. It's the kind of idea about the level that we're talking about um, that would be charged on transactions. Here we go. Hey, buddy, can you spare 0.05% of your financial transactions? We believe they can, and I think the public believes that they can too. Um, and it is interesting that the church, um, which has always supported this issue, is once again passionately coming out. The church were completely fundamental to the success of the Make Poverty History and the Jubilee campaigns. Uh, and once again, the simple fundamental um, arguments, both about poverty domestically and abroad, um, are finding um, support in the church, and we're looking forward. And I think that might be an important thing uh, in the United States as well when we begin to campaign there. So we've got a plan, and our plan is to launch and launch and launch again um, uh, until it happens. And finally, uh, I'll introduce Bill to just say a word about um, the first, in what I trust will be a sequence of films that we'll be making on the issue. But I, I genuinely, we've been surprised and delighted by 
the public passion for this campaign. We genuinely believe it's a hugely popular, immediate thing for politicians to do. Uh, and we would ask everyone here and generally to think about it, argue about it, and see whether or not we can uh, make it happen. Uh, good morning. I am not an economist, but I, it's important that you know that I am wearing green tights under my trousers. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Um, I, uh, I'm here to introduce the film that Richard uh, wrote and directed in which I'm in, and I was, I s presume, recruited to be in it largely because uh, what's required of me is to squirm. And those of you who have followed my work will know that that's played a large part in my career generally. <laughs> um, it's my kind of forte. I, uh, I'm a passionate supporter of the Robin Hood tax. It seems to me um, a very simple and beautiful idea, which is Jeffrey Sachs, and as Richard has explained, has really, to use the cliche, found its time. I see there is, it's pristine. There is nothing wrong with it. I'm also accustomed to the phenomenon, phenomenon of people uh, uh, telling me and us that it's unworkable, impossible, and it, you know, as they have done in the past, as Richard's explained, and then things do change and people's lives are saved and revolutionized by what seems to be a sort of simple idea, too simple to be true, but in fact it's that good. Um, I, um, it's also beautiful that you can make something like this commercial, as it were, that you're about to see, and that within three days or within uh, a, a, a short period, something close to a million people have, uh, have viewed it on YouTube, um, and therefore it's obviously a very successful tool in that way. So um, here it is. Thank you. Have you had this idea about the Robin Hood banker's tax? Yes. It's a sweet little idea, taxing the banks to help the poor, but I, I don't think it'll work. It's very complicated and will be very tough on the banking sector. Which has just been given billions of pounds of taxpayers' money to keep it going. Well, yeah, of course. And is still paying itself billions of pounds in bonuses. Yes. So the tax is a charge on all bank transactions that don't include members of the public. Bonds, derivatives, currency, speculative stuff. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. Very complex. So the bankers would give how much from each deal they do? Uh, 25%? <laughs> well, no, not that much. 10%? No. 5%? No, not 5 More or less? Slightly less. What, 1%? Not quite. Half of one percent? No. A tenth of a percent? Uh, no. Half of that? They give around 0.05 percent of every deal? Yeah, that's about right. And sometimes it'd be even less. That doesn't sound like a lot to most people. No. I can see that. And how much would it raise to, to help people at home and abroad? Oh, a fair amount, I believe. About a million pounds a year? No, more than that. 100 million pounds? Uh, more. 500 million pounds? Um, well, um... A billion pounds a year? No, it's slightly more than that, I'm told. 10 billion pounds? More. 50 billion pounds? Yeah, that sounds about right. In fact, I believe it's likely to be more than 100 billion pounds. Could be double that. Could be more than double. Um, yeah, uh, um, possibly. Uh... Right, so let me get this clear. A tiny tax on the banks could raise billions of pounds every year to help save lives in the poorest countries, fund crucial action against climate change around the world, and help avoid cuts to crucial public services in this country. Gosh. Well, yeah, um, that, that is about the um, um, sum of it. I, d I don't know. P perhaps it's um, quite a good idea. If I lay here, if I just lay here, would you lie with me and just forget the world?
appreciate the use of Snow Patrol at the end. Um, that's the rock band, sorry. Um, we're now going to go to uh, Q&A, so if we could ask the, uh, the panelists to come up onto the stage. So, Jeff, you have already met. Uh, Dr. Claire Melamed is currently Head of Policy Coordination at ActionAid UK. And that's the uh, latest of several NGOs she's worked for over the past decade on a whole range of issues to do with development, trade, aid, um, poverty, and, uh, and globalization. And on the end is uh, Major Ivor Telfer, who's an Assistant Secretary for Program at the Salvation Army. Um, Major Telfer was stationed in Newry in Northern Ireland uh, at the height of the Troubles in the mid-1980s and as a rest cure after that uh, went and ran the Afghan refugee camp in Peshawar in Pakistan uh, with 120,000 registered um, refugees. Uh, I just wonder if Claire and Ivor would like to say anything on what they've heard so far or, or the issue as they see it before we open up to Q&A. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, I think as as Jeffrey said, you know, one of the really exciting things about this campaign is that there's a real political opportunity now. There's a massive public mood in favor of this campaign. We've already got over 130,000 people signed up to the campaign's Facebook site, and they're still going up at several thousands every week. Um, and because there's such a crucial need for money, governments are gonna have to get the money from somewhere. And when you compare the transaction tax with any of the other ways governments have of raising money through VAT, through income tax rises, this is a much better way. It raises much more money and it's much fairer because the burden of the tax falls, as Jeffrey said, on the people who are most able to pay. So it's a popular tax. It's also politically, this is the moment for the tax. So it's a really exciting, exciting day and exciting time for us all to be here. Thank you. Salvage and Army, we're really pleased to be here and to be part of this campaign. We totally support it. And uh, as a Christian church and a social caring organisation in 119 countries, we're certainly passionate about this financial transaction tax. In fact, in October 1890, um, even a little bit before Professor Tobin, William Booth launched his book and scheme, Darkest England and the Way Out. Let me comment from his book. The theory of the system is this that individuals, casually poor and out of work, being destitute and without shelter, may upon application receive shelter for the night, supper and a breakfast, and in return for this shall perform a task of work, not necessarily in repayment for the relief received, but simply as a test of their willingness to work for their living. The work given is the same as that given to felons in jail, oakum picking and stone breaking. We're not advocating that, of course. Um, but what we are advocating is a hand up, not a hand out. Booth commented about the submerged tenth in England at that particular time. Oxfam's website comments about 13 million people in the UK, one in five, who are in poverty. Not a submerged tenth, a submerged fifth. We've been involved in a lot of research with um, the University of Kent and Cardiff and have published documents called Seeds of Exclusion. They're available on the website. And what we've been looking at are what are the causes of social exclusion? What are the factors that cause people to get into uh, the situation of being socially excluded? A lot of those factors relate very much to early childhood experiences. We need to be around and able and willing to support people in bringing up families. We need to um, make sure it's not a big brother attitude, but we've got to be there to support and to help and to encourage so that we prevent people coming into those particular areas. The Marmot Review as well is something that has come out um, recently. Social determinants of health, the postcode lottery, depending on where you have been born, depends on how long you will live. This is in the UK, not in developing countries. The annual income through the, through the charity sector for social care is £29 billion a year. As government spending cuts come, 
Whoever wins the next election, the voluntary sector will be required to implement government-funded contracts for less money, will be required to seek more funds to implement frontline support services, which cannot be funded through local area agreements, and will find it increasingly difficult to raise additional funds from an already cash-strapped public. The financial transaction tax can assist the third sector to decrease in the UK the 13 million people, the one in five, who are actually in poverty. The moral argument is clear, and as a former banker, I have got to say the poor are becoming poorer and the rich need to step in and redress the balance. Not a handout, but a hand up.